We regularly visit accommodation and work sites to check on the welfare of workers and employers are required to submit regular reports, Steve would probably say too many, uh, to our team to ensure our workers receive adequate financial benefit from their time in Australia. These measures ensure Pacific and Timor-Leste workers are protected from mistreatment. The safety and wellbeing of Pacific and Timor-Leste workers under the scheme is our highest priority and our dedicated worker welfare team ensures that worker welfare is at the heart of our approach. We recognise that workers are connected to local communities and we recognise that workers that are connected to local communities have better wellbeing. So we facilitate connections to community groups and other supports such as churches and sporting groups through important partners, um, some of whom we see here today. Thank you, Mark and, and Emma for coming along. Um, uh, what we're really hoping through that is that workers can build strong relationships that connect them to their communities in their new home. We ensure that workers are briefed on their workplace rights prior to departure and on arrival and produce information in language on issues that we know are cause for concern for both workers and employers, such as deductions and accommodation. We, open, we openly welcome and strongly encourage workers and their advocates to bring forward for investigation concerns around worker welfare directly to the department. Um, to our implementing partner, the Pacific Labor Facility, and or through the Palm Support uh, Service Line, which operates 24 hours, seven days a week. Any complaint or concern that is brought to us through any mechanism will be closely looked at. Pacific Labor is a success story resulting from strong partnerships between Australia and Pacific Nations and Timor-Leste, and the scheme is constantly ev evolving to respond to Australia's needs and those of our Pacific neighbours. Since September last year, DFAT and has been leading a process in close collaboration with other agencies uh, of government in Australia to reform, streamline and consolidate our Pacific labour mobility programs. So while today we'll be focusing largely on uh, se seasonal uh, programs, and for Australia that's the seasonal worker program, we also have the longer term Pacific labour scheme and those programs are now being managed together by DFAT as the Pacific Australia Labour Mobility or PALM scheme. Um, and we, we now have a single Palm Scheme visa. So that, that recently introduced visa provides more flexibility to workers and their employers. Workers can now remain in Australia for up to four years and can make multiple entries during that time um, with the seasonal cohort uh, requiring uh, three months offshore each year out of every, out of every 12 months. This gives Australian employers better workforce stability and workers more time to develop skills, complete formal qualifications and earn income to send home to their families and communities. Seasonal workers will also be able to move between employers more easily if there are appropriate jobs available to them that cannot be filled by Australians. Recruitment caps have been removed for or will be removed for existing employers with a good track record and, and uh, we are putting in place more staff who can cover every state and territory to support employers and workers and removing restrictions on the sectors uh, that are able to recruit seasonal workers, though requirements around a focus in rural and regional Australia will remain. Um, so that means now that all employers with a seasonal workforce needs in rural or regional Australia can now apply to access the scheme. I would also note though that we've heard the concerns of some of our Pacific neighbours about the negative social impacts of labour mobility. Family separation and brain drain in particular come to mind. And we're strongly committed to working together with our partners across the Pacific and Timor-Leste to address those concerns. DFAT is genuinely committed to continuously improving the PALM scheme, building capacity to address immediate and long-term workforce shortages, ensure worker protections and simplifying and improving delivery for industry. To this end, I'm really delighted to be here today to learn about the successes and challenges of seasonal labour programs in other countries. We have much to share and learn from one another and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you to everyone for being here today and thanks for your time. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Carly. It's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Philip Martin from the Global Migration Centre, University of California, Davis, Professor Emeritus, Agriculture, Agricultural and Resource Economics. Welcome, Philip. 
Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And I've got a little controller here. So I'm Phil Martin. I actually did some farm work uh, back in my youth. I don't do farm work anymore. And I, back when I did farm work in the eastern part of the United States, farmers brought in Puerto Ricans who happened to be US citizens, but whose incomes are roughly one third of what the incomes are in the US mainland. And what happened in the island of Puerto Rico is they used to have a lot of sugar mills, the sugar mills closed, a lot of rural people didn't have jobs, and they came seasonally to the United States, or to the mainland part of the United States, to do uh, seasonal farm work. And so it's all seasonal farm worker programs are primarily men. It's typically 80, 90% men. They're often young men. Uh, sometimes for, away from their families for the first time, and managing migrant seasonal workers far from home is a challenge, I think, everywhere and anywhere. What I'm going to do is focus on some comparisons between, uh, or tell you some stories about how the farm labor system works in the U.S., but in particularly in California. And the way to sort of think about this is that California is producing horticultural commodities for 325 million Americans in a land area that's about 1 20th the size of Australia. But you'll see that even within California, seasonal farm labor is heavily concentrated. Seasonal farm labor is concentrated in three ways in every country by commodity, by region, and by size of employer. They're interconnected. It's big fruit and vegetable growers in a limited number of areas who employ the most seasonal workers, whether that's domestic or farm. So what are the punchlines that come out of this? So Australia has farm sales of something on the order of 55 billion US dollars, I think, a year. So California's a little less in farm sales than Australia. But what stands out for California is that almost three-fourths of those farm sales are fruits, vegetables, and horticultural specialties. We call them FVH. You call them in Australia horticulture. So for us, horticulture is flowers, potted plants, mushrooms, things like that. For you, horticulture includes uh, fruits, nuts, and vegetables. So California basically is producing fruits and vegetables and other horticultural specialties, and then shipping them 72 hours. It's 72 hours by truck from California to New York. And because California is an open air greenhouse, where it really doesn't rain between April and October, the lettuces produced in California look fresher than the lettuces that come from two miles away. And so the whole genius of California agriculture is to have an open air greenhouse, even though it happens to be distant from most Americans. In order to do that, you need people. The average employment is about 425,000. So about, if you took a snapshot every month, added them up, divide by 12, you get 425,000 people employed in California agriculture. And the comparable thing, as I understand it for Australia, is maybe 135,000 in the horticultural sector. But of course, you need more workers than jobs, and the ratio is roughly two to one. So, in, so if I have a year-round job on my strawberry farm, and remember, it's going to be shut down for a few months, I'm going to be hiring two workers uh, for each year-round equivalent job. Who are the people? They're, they're not people born in the United States. In California, 90% were born outside the U.S., usually in Mexico. And the, 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 just as you talk about the difference between working holiday makers and Pacific Islanders, we talk about the difference between unauthorized workers and legal guest workers. The unauthorized are like the working holiday makers. They pay their own way to the U.S., they find their own housing, they, get their, they make their own way to work. The H-2A, our guest worker program, is just like the Pacific Island. The employer pays for the transportation, the employer pays for the housing and everything else. And of course, the big question is very similar, is how do you substitute legal for, in our case, unauthorized, or what's the balance between working holiday makers? But what happens is, is that labor costs are rising a lot. And what's been happening, there are three responses to it, three responses here, the three responses in Canada, three, is there's a lot more mechanization. There is more mechanization occurring in labor-intensive agriculture now than there's been, at least in the United States, for 30 or 40 years. We have a lot more guest workers. And the whole trick is that 
the, the system is evolving to have what we call super labor contractors, people who employ five, 10,000 people. They have permanent offices in sending countries. Some of them operate farms in sending countries just to train and select the best workers to bring in the US. So in the United States, we do sports and we say, the H2A guest workers are the NFL of all pickers. When I study how many bins of apples they pick, so a normal worker in the United States will pick eight 1,000 bins of apple a day, uh, a day, no, four in a day, so they pick about a half a bin an hour. Uh, an H2A guest worker can do three-fourths of a bin an hour. They're young, they're in the U.S. to work, and they're more productive. And so we are getting these super labor contractors who have permanent offices abroad, they're bringing in trained workers, and then of course one thing that you perhaps don't have as much as we do is we import a lot of fruits and vegetables. 60% of the fresh fruit in the U.S. is imported, uh, about 35% of the fresh vegetables, a lot of them come from Mexico. So just, to, just so you get a flavor, because in some ways California, of course, is very different from, in other ways it's very similar to, uh, uh, Australia, in the sense that if you look at a map of California, remember it's only 1 20th the size of Australia, but the agriculture is in that red zone. You know, without irrigation, it's, it, the land isn't worth much. And so when you actually look at how much land is farmed, it's only, it's only about 8% of the total land area that's really farmed. And the reason why only 8% is farmed is that's where the water is. If it weren't for the water, the, you know, the land is very, very inexpensive. And what we're getting is that even though it's not labor intensive, you know, the biggest part of the horticultural sector is nuts, almonds, pistachios, and walnuts. And they have acres and acres of these uh, uh, trees planted. And of course, the irony is people are putting out a lot of money to put in perennial crops without a guaranteed supply of water. And so an even bigger issue than labor in a state like California is what about water? I mean, our whole, the California water system is the number one user of electricity in the world because water is heavy and, you, and we lift you, can you push water uphill? Yes, you can, but it takes an awful lot of energy. And so the whole system is built on snow falling in the winter, melting in the summer and going into dams, and then moved by gravity and by pumps from the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state. So two-thirds of the people live in Southern California, two-thirds of the water is in the north, and moving that water north to south is a huge issue. And a whole lot of people plant perennial crops, especially nuts, without enough water guaranteed. So we have this bit, the big debate in, in, in the United States is, how do you assure enough water for irrigated Western agriculture? It's not just California, it's also other places as well. We're talking about huge projects because we have environmental concerns and we have water concerns, but we're here to talk labor. And the way our system works is we divide agriculture into about 35 different sectors. So there's the beef and cattle sector, the dairy sector, the hogs, the poultry. But when, it, when you're really talking labor, only five count. And the number one sector for labor is what we call crop support. So crop support are non-farm employers who bring workers to farms. And that is by far the biggest sector for employment in uh, California agriculture. Then comes fruits and nuts, then comes vegetables, then comes greenhouses, and then comes dairies. Uh, and so for all practical purposes, five sectors account for 90% for of the wages paid. So beef doesn't really matter, poultry, eggs. I mean, they do hire workers, there are some big operations, but by and large, it doesn't really matter. And then who are those crop support? Well, you call them labor hire firms, we call them farm labor contractors. So a farm labor contractor is a non-farm entity that brings workers to farms. And in theory, labor contractors should increase efficiency. After all, I'm a seasonal worker. I expect to have three or four seasonal jobs. Instead of me trying to line up jobs, I let somebody else do it. They take a cut. And by the same token, I'm a small farmer and I've got a peak seasonal need for 20 or 30 workers. Instead of me doing that, turn it over to a labor contractor, and they should be able to more efficiently bring a crew of worker and get it done. So in theory, labor contracting is a good business. In practice, I mean, it's a plus-plus business. In practice, it tends not to work that way, huh? well. And there's a lot of reasons for it, but perhaps the main reason is that the major asset of a farm labor contractor 
is typically the contacts with employers and contacts with workers. They usually have relatively little bargaining power with employers. So in our system, the way it normally works is the minimum wage is the base wage, and then the contractor gets an overhead on top of that to cover workers' compensation, to cover um, uh, payroll taxes, pension, et cetera, unemployment insurance, and of course, toilets in the field and eventually record keeping. And the norm is about 40%. So whatever the wage is, you've got to add 40%. All of a sudden, we're seeing sometimes labor contracts say, ah, maybe can do it for 32 or 33. Well, they gotta be breaking the law. What they're doing is they don't pay all the payroll taxes and they count on the fact that the workers aren't going to complain because they know the workers. Sometimes they're their relatives, et cetera. So we get a lot of, the question is always, are you increasing efficiency or are these entities serving as the risk absorbers uh, because we have a labor market that's got violations? Where labor contractors are used mostly is in jobs where it's easier to measure output than it is to measure input. So you know there are two wage systems, two rough wage systems in agriculture, hourly and piece rate. Now, there's also salary and stuff, but essentially most jobs are hourly. And you can monitor effort. As an employer, you're always saying a fair day's work, a fair day, day's pay. You can monitor effort by having, let's say, a working supervisor. So you see a crew of weeders or hoers going through a field, and there's one person who's setting the pace, and that's typically a worker supervisor who's gonna get an extra 50 cents or a dollar an hour. But if people are climbing trees and picking apples or oranges, it's easier to measure how many bins they pick than it is to measure whether they're really working as fast as they possibly could. So what you do is you set a piece rate, a typical piece rate in the US for picking apples is 25 or $30 to pick a thousand pound bin. And you then count the bin. So it's, you count the output and you make sure that the average worker is gonna earn between 15 and 25% more than the minimum wage at an average pace. And that way you will motivate people to work without having to do close supervision. So we normally see a combination of labor contractors and piece rates in tree fruits because there it's more difficult to monitor workers. The largest single employer in the state are strawberry farms. They, their average employment is roughly 25,000, so we have about 35,000 acres of strawberries, and the average employment over the year is about 25,000, but remember you need twice as many workers, there's peak seasons and stuff, and so that gives 50,000 workers. The number two one is grapes, average employment's a little lower, but once again, you, and we have three kinds of grapes, table grapes, raisin grapes, and wine grapes. The wine grapes are typically mechanized. Then we get vegetables and melons, uh, where the average employment is lower. Part of that is artificial because once a labor contractor brings workers to farms in our data system, we can't tell what crops they're working in in the normal data. But fruits are far more labor intensive uh, than vegetables in general. And the structure of employment is different. We can talk about that. And then we have greenhouse and nurseries uh, that have a fairly high average employment. They tend to have less worker turn turnover in part because some of the jobs are year round. And in the lower, uh, in your lower right corner, you know, you know cannabis is the big growing thing. The, the emerging new um, uh, sector, we had an awful lot of flower uh, places and they were all displaced by imports from Colombia and Ecuador. Those glass houses are still there. They're coming back as growing uh, marijuana. And then we have a very big dairy sector in California uh, that typically operates 24-7, 365. And the normal ratio is somewhere between 75 and 100 cows. Uh, means you need one milker. And the biggest dairies are often in the 5,000. I think the biggest single one in the U.S. is around 30,000 cows. But a lot of these are in the five, 6,000 cow range. So they have a lot of milkers. So California is a state in which more workers are brought to crop farms by crop support firms, those labor contractors that are hired directly. And you can see the gap was growing. We had COVID come in and it tilted down because the labor contractors are the shock absorbers. You hire them when you need them, you don't hire them when you don't need them. And we'll talk a little bit uh, about what that means for labor contracting firms. Uh, they need a lot of capital to ride out ups and downs in the market and sometimes they don't have that. I've already mentioned the, the fact that 
there's a roughly two to one ratio between workers to jobs. So red is the number of unique people who work for wages on farms in California agriculture, and blue is the number of full-time equivalent jobs. So in a, in a truly, in a non-seasonal agricultural sector, uh, the two lines would be the same. So if this were University of California, the blue jobs would be how many jobs there are, the red would be how many people, and they would be roughly at the same level. There's very little turnover. Uh, and so um, when we look at agriculture, there's both seasonality and turnover. And that, that really reflects the fact that if you were to take in our data, if you take what an average job should pay and then look at what an average worker gets, there's always a gap. So if you take all the wages that are paid and the average number of jobs, you actually come out with saying the average farm worker earns 30000 a year. And for 2,000 hours a year, that's $15 an hour. But of course, there is no average worker. And the average earnings of workers is, is only half that. Why? Well, some of them don't earn as much per hour, but the biggest problem, the biggest issue is most of them don't work uh, that many hours. If you look at pay stubs of workers, um, typically somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 hours a year. So if you're earning, the average hourly wage in the United States is roughly $30 an hour. If you're earning half as much, working half as many hours, you get one-fourth as much an annual income, which is one reason why uh, farm work tends to be an exit labor market. If you don't like it, you tend to get out. Who are the workers? I've already mentioned. They're, they're, the, the, the heart of the seasonal workforce in the U.S., and especially in California, are unauthorized workers who were born in Mexico. They typically came in their 20s, and they came in the 1990s and until the 2008-9 recession. They're now getting older. They tend to be settled in one area, have one employer. That employer could be a labor contractor who moves from one farm to the next. The, of course, and I'm, I assume the same is true in Australia, the children of seasonal farm workers who are educated in the country don't go into the fields. So if you talk, I've talked to a lot of farm workers and farm work children over the years, people will normally say, this is okay for me, but not for my children. I want that, I'm doing this so that they get a better job. So what that means is that the future farm workers to fill seasonal jobs are growing up somewhere outside the US. Right now it happens to be Mexico, um, but it could well be Central America or Asia or some other place. You can see how much they report earning, et cetera. But I think the main takeaway is for a typical unauthorized worker, and remember, half of them are unauthorized, it's just like a work, farm work is like a non, uh, is like non farm work. You don't live on the farm where you work, you commute to work, often you carpool, and you only have one farm employer in the course of the year. And, so, and those workers now, because unauthorized Mexico's migration roughly stopped in 2008, 2009, they're getting older, um, they're settled down, most of them have U.S. born children. And that was the story when COVID hit in the spring of 2020. And COVID raised the labor cost because you had to do all kinds of things like, and remember, uh, agriculture was considered essential. Uh, and there were lots and lots of schemes, there were lots and lots of predictions about how crops would not be picked and uh, uh, lettuce would cost $5 a head, et cetera. It didn't happen. I mean, one of the biggest irony or one of the biggest stories that nobody writes about is how little COVID there was among farm workers, not how much. Watch, all these predictions people made about the losses uh, that were going to happen because there would be nobody to pick the crops didn't happen. I, there's a lot of arguments that you could make about why it didn't happen. Maybe because the people worked outdoors, maybe because farmers made investments in putting up plastic shields. I mean, you could, I mean the big, the, but the main takeaway is we had far less COVID among workers who were poor, lived in crowded housing, everything than what we expected. There was COVID in the food system, no two ways about it. There was lots of COVID, but where it was, was in what we call food processing. Meat packing, uh, vegetable packing. It's a, when you bring workers together, some of these big meat packing plants are running 1,000 or 2,000 people per shift, and they're right next to each other on the so-called disassembly lines cutting up meat. We had lots of COVID there. Cold, wet climates, but those were not farm workers. They were non-farm workers, technically. I mean, they, that is a non-farm job. And so 
there was a lot of confusion because many people in food processing are also Hispanic. There was a lot of, there were many stories in the media about COVID among farm workers when what they meant was COVID among non-farm workers, but in the food system. So California now has a $15 minimum wage. The, we have a federal system, so there's a federal minimum wage that applies everywhere and states have minimum wages. 30 states have minimum wages higher than the federal standard. And so we have, we have now uh, over a two to one gap between the highest and lowest minimum wages across regions. And with those higher labor costs, we're getting these three trends that I'll talk about here, here briefly and we can talk then more about the H2A if we want. First is we're getting a lot more mechanization. There's gonna be a huge wave of mechanization coming. There's gonna be a lot more guest workers and there will be more imports. The, the mechanization story is pretty familiar because after all, the whole story of human history is mechanization and agriculture. And the, the big real story is that most predictions that it would be hard to mechanize have to, in agriculture, I mean, some of them are true, it is hard to mechanize a lot of things in agriculture, but a, a whole lot of things that people said could never be mechanized now are. So all the new olive tree plantings are all for mechanical harvesting. The baby carrot story was all based on mechanization, cutting up, cutting up the carrots. Uh, UC Davis did the tomato harvester for processing tomatoes. In the nurseries, they move plants around all the time. And if you talk to the people who do robotics, the main investor in robotics in the United States is the military. And in the military, the idea is performance, not cost. Spend $10 million, save a soldier. In agriculture, it's all about cost, not performance. It doesn't matter if you get every apple in the tree, but you really have to have a durable machine that works day in and day out. And so this little plant thing, the first version of it cost $100,000. It was a great machine, but they needed to strip it down to the basics and get it down to something like $15,000 before the nurseries started buying it. It's all about cost and durability in agriculture. And so that's why when you take a crop like strawberry, the question is, how do you even go about thinking about mechanizing strawberries? You've got this soft, perishable fruit. What's probably going to happen is, so the biggest companies are invest, and what I'm about, what if I didn't say it, I should have said, the big companies that are thinking 10 years ahead are investing in all three. They're investing in machines, they're investing in housing for guest workers, and they're investing in producing abroad. They're doing all, because standing in 2022, you don't know which is going to succeed, and it's going to succeed differently for different commodities. So in strawberries, as you know, we pick fresh strawberries right into the clamshells in which they're sold, and we have processing or juice berries that just go into a big tray. So clearly workers pick a lot faster when they're picking into big trays than when they're picking into the clamshells that you see. So what will, probably what will happen is they'll mechanize the packing into clamshells in the packing house first. So the workers will pick faster and then they'll be put into clamshells in the packing house. And then they'll figure out how to mechanize in the fields. All the experiments to pick individual strawberries, by and large, probably won't work because they do too much damage to the plants as they're growing. The other big thing that's happening is the rise of indoor farming. The amount of venture capital going into indoor farming in the United States is just phenomenal. It's already a big deal in Canada, as we'll hear in the tomato industry. It's also a huge deal in Mexico. And when you think about this, don't think of glass houses with the most expensive version. Think of a, just a, a, a plastic covered hoop structure with some met, perhaps netting at each end to keep out birds and stuff. The, the yields go way up, the water efficiency goes way up, and you can design automation right into the system from the start. There's also a big spread in mechanical aids. So one of the hardest things to get people to do is to pick from ladders with a bag over your shoulder. It's gonna weigh 50 or 60 pounds. So doing this idea of hydraulic lifts, that substitute for ladder. These cost about $60,000 each. And what we're actually finding is it's easier to get guest workers to use them than it is to get US workers. US, you know, a lot of people are used to, I pick my four bins at $30 a bin and I get my $120. Uh, but I don't want to share it with you. You might not be as fast as me. And if we're picking on a platform, we've got four or eight people sharing the piece rate at the end of the day. And that's kind of been easier to do with guest workers than it has been to US workers who are so used to individual piece rate systems. Our guest worker program is called the H2A program. 
and it's got a complicated structure, uh, but it's run by three agencies, the labor agency, the home affairs or interior agency, and then the visas are issued by the State Department abroad. And you can see the main story is growth. It, the growth in the number of jobs certified, growth in the number of visas issued, um, they almost all go to Mexicans. The Mexicans stay in the United States an average six months, so there's not that much flying. It's mostly buses, long bus rides. And um, we are rapidly getting to the point where right now, H-2As are about 15% of average employment in agriculture. We had a previous program that has a bad reputation called Perceros. At the peak, that was 20%. So we're getting back to where we were in the 1950s. The, the main thing with the H-2A programs, we have 50 states, and there is agriculture in each state. But the three states on the West Coast, so-called left side of the United States, California, Oregon, and Washington, they have half of all the hired farm workers in the US. And the way to think about fruit and vegetable agriculture is, Two-thirds of all Americans live east of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana. Two-thirds of all fruits and vegetables are from west of Utah and Arizona and stuff. So the trick is, how do you grow it one place and ship it 3,000 miles to someplace else? And of course, the trick was to put up the interstate highway systems and have these uh, uh, trucks go and deliver in um, 72 hours from California to New York. So, Fruits and vegetables are the yellow and blue. You remember, you can have H2A guest workers in any agricultural commodity so long as it's temporary or seasonal, but fruits and vegetables are where most of the jobs are. And the thing to note is not only are the number of guest worker jobs going up, the role of labor contractors in bringing workers in is going up. So roughly half of the jobs in fruit are with labor contractors. The same is true with vegetables. And here, here's the real economics of looking at U.S. workers. And remember, when I say U.S., that means really an unauthorized worker settled in the United States. The H-2A workers cost more, but they're younger. So the average unauthorized worker is in his early 40s. The average H-2A is late, high 20s, early 30s. As I said, they're more productive in terms of boxes or bins or anything else. And they provide labor insurance. So a U.S. worker can show up today and not show up tomorrow. Uh, an H-2A worker, if he or she does not work, they're not allowed to stay legally in the United States. So the real question is, you know, what's that worth? What's the labor insurance worth? If you have a highly perishable commodity, it could be worth a lot. If you have, let's say, citrus, so citrus does not use yet a lot of H-2As because the oranges can hang on the trees without a lot of damage for a week or so most times of the year. But strawberries are very perishable, so there the value of labor insurance is more. And then we do something that I don't know if you do. The employers do have to pay for transportation and housing, but they don't pay payroll taxes. So we call Social Security and unemployment insurance a, a payroll tax. And that's roughly, it's 8% and 8%, 8% employer, 8% employee, and then about 4 or 5% for unemployment insurance. So the H-2A workers, yes, they're more expensive because of housing and trends, but they're cheaper in a sense because you save at least 10% on payroll taxes by hiring them. So how, how does it really work? I mean, the basic idea is, we're, and you might be having, I understand, the same debates here. How do you reconcile the different, the, the, we have a, what I call an iron triangle between the minimum wage the piece rate, and the productivity standard, okay? So think of it as an equation. The government sets the minimum wage. The employer sets the piece rate. And that automatically defines a productivity standard. I mean, make it simple. Say the minimum wage is $10 an hour. And say the piece rate is $20 a bin to pick apples. Now what that means is that if I work eight hours, my employer's gotta pay me $80. Let's suppose I only pick three bins of apples, so I actually only earned $60. Well, then the employer's got to make up that $20, but there's no rule in any labor law that says, if you can't do the job, the employer has to keep you. So in a very infamous case, uh, the Florida sugarcane guys brought workers in. They brought 10,000 workers in to hand cut sugarcane. 
And they deliberately fired roughly 80, 90 of them at the beginning of every season, uh, mostly came, because the rest of the workers, many of whom had paid money, they weren't supposed to to get there, they saw if you don't work fast enough, you're going home. And that they had figured out, that was the only case I really know about, that they had figured out that they could actually get away with 10,000 workers instead of 13,000 by getting everybody up to speed right away. And, and so keep in mind that our big story is when, when we keep raising the minimum wage, but, if the, but the question is what should happen to the peace rate? The government is not setting peace rates. The government lets employers set peace rates, and what the government does is try to regulate how peace rates change. And we're getting lots of debates about this because the new apple varieties, they're worth a lot more to the grower, but they bruise easier and the bruise is often internal so you don't see it until you cut it open and then you don't like that apple and stuff. So there's a lot of hassles between this triangle between minimum wages, productivity standards, and peace rates. Because if you, if you raise the minimum wage but keep the peace rate the same, the productivity standard has gone up. There's some people who can do it, some can't. So I already gone, went through that they, they cost more. We do have a reform pending. It's probably not gonna go anywhere, so it's passed a few times, but the basic deal we usually do in agriculture in the United States with ag labor is we legalize the unauthorized people who are already there. We say, it's just too bad, we didn't obey the law, we didn't enforce the law, people came. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to legalize, we're gonna wipe the slate clean, and then we're gonna make it easier for employers to hire legal workers in the future. And the net effect will be no more unauthorized workers. Okay, when I started in this business, I was working in Washington. At that time, we had, say, 20% unauthorized workers in agriculture, now we have 50%, so it never works. I mean, you don't have just one back operation, you don't have just one legalization, you always have many more. But that's the proposal. The other, what's more likely to happen is this, it, you know, the most successful labor contractors bringing in guest workers are big operations, typically in the three to 5,000 worker range. What they want, what I think is doable, is to give them, an, um, is to let them be certified for multiple years, don't go through this annual certification, uh, get, give the workers multi-year visas, and have them come as a crew ready to go to work, their own supervisors, their own drivers, their own cooks, and take advantage of economies of scale. I mean, the idea of a guy bringing in 10 workers for eight months and going through all that paperwork and following all that rules, that's pretty hopeless, to be honest. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of work on the enforcement side. There are some business models that depend on cheating the workers, but a lot of it is just people. These are a lot of rules to follow, and a lot of small people can't do it. So. The final thing, and then I'll wrap up because I know we're running uh, late here, is you could also do imports. And we're, I know Australia's a long way from uh, a lot of places, and it's important to remember most fresh fruits and, if you don't remember anything else, fresh fruits and vegetables are mostly water. Over 90% of the volume of most every tomatoes, they're all over 90% water. So what you're really doing is bringing water and photosynthesis together at one place and sending it somewhere else to be consumed. We happen to, have a land border with a big country that has a complementary climate. And so we import most of our fruit and most of our vegetables from Mexico. So 60% of the fresh tomatoes we consume in the US come from Mexico, a couple of percent come from Canada. We bring in avocados, we bring in other things. And so when you look at a country like Mexico, and then you think Morocco is playing the same role for the EU, as you know, of all the cucumbers, for example, they grow in Mexico, six out of 10 are being sent up to the United States. There's these big farms in Mexico that are producing exclusively really for the United States. The food safety standards there and the labor standards in many cases are actually higher than they are in the US because the risk of doing it wrong is enormous. You get your crop blocked and the local Mexican market has much, much lower wages. Our ag, probably like your ag, has traditionally been free trade. Ag has always been for free trade, but we're getting some segments of agriculture, especially in the southeastern United States, that are getting very protectionist. So our southeast would probably be more like your Queensland. They're the ones who have to compete with the crops that come from lower wage countries. And so we have a project in Mexico looking at how things work. Mexico's got roughly 3 million hired farm workers 
U.S. has about two and a half million. And of those three million hired workers, about one fourth work on these export farms. And on those export farms, it's a totally different story than it is in producing for de the domestic Mexican market. And so the, the real big thing is, you know, how do you think about development? Do you want people to have the jobs in Mexico producing there and shipping the stuff to the US? Do you want to bring them as guest workers to the US? Do you want to do both? So the big story in all this is we've got wages going up, we've got these responses, and probably what's most likely to happen is that we're going to get fewer and larger big labor contractors who are able to compete uh, because they get economies of scale in the recruitment and management of seasonal workers. Uh, in, in some cases, that will come quicker. That's happening very fast in some of the fruits and vegetables in, in California, for example. In other cases, it'll be a little slower. If you want to learn more about this, you can always look uh, on the website that has more. But let me stop there, and we can move on to the next one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philip. Okay, so now we're going to move online. Just let the tech team set it up. And our next speaker, and um, apologies that we're running a bit behind schedule to those of you online and in the room. But our next speaker is Robert Falconer. He's research associate at the School of Public Policy, University of Calgary. And he's going to speak on Canada and the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. That's not Robert, that's me. Thank you for having me today. Great. <laughs> hey, uh, can everybody hear me? Can I get a thumbs up there from the front? Perfect. Um, let me just show my screen here. One minute. Okay, and if I, I just throw it in the chat box if you can't see us, but um, again, first off, thank you very much for the invitation today, uh, especially to, to Professor Martin for arranging it, and uh, I owe an apology to Professor Kurt for causing me to probably lose a few hairs over the last few days um, over the, uh, a tight submission of my slides, but again, thank you for having me today. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, as mentioned, I'm a research associate with the University of Calgary. I focus on immigration and refugee policy and quantitative research. Or, and uh, those are the two websites that are in particular those focused on agriculture. Maybe interested on the one on the right, simpsoncenter.ca, which is um, a new research division uh, launched at the University of Calgary, specifically focusing on agriculture, um, agricultural technologies and agricultural labor. Uh, same with Philip, I actually have some practical experience in, um, in, in farming and uh, agriculture here in Canada. I um, grew up working in the, the areas of, in the Okanagan and the East Coonies of British Columbia, specifically in the cherry industry, where approximately about 35% of all agricultural workers are temporary farm workers. And they shot at me there at with some of my former colleagues there in that industry. Um, to, to start us off, uh, when we talk about agricultural immigration and temporary foreign workers in Canada, the reason is there's actually three different programs. One, by and large, dominates the, the industry. This is SOP, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. It is a, a temporary, uh, non extendable visa um, for Canada that, that is specific to a few countries, um, mostly Mexico, Central America, and, and participating Caribbean states. There's also a 
networks. When you take the owners and operators out, um, they, they actually comprise about half of all uh, employees or paid laborers in, in, the, in the field. We don't have really good, super good numbers on the number of undocumented workers in the sector. Um, it, it certainly isn't as big as uh, the United States, as, as Philip outlined. Um, some conservative estimates say that for every about five legal workers under SOP, there is maybe about one undocumented worker. It's not only primary agriculture, though, that we're seeing the growth in the employment of foreign workers, but we're also seeing growth in, uh, in food manufacturing as well, that secondary processing of food. Um, this is particularly true in seafood processing in the Atlantic Canada. You can see there are the purple bars. That's um, the share of foreign workers in PEI, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick is, is quite high. And actually, the federal government just list, lifted the cap of, of foreign workers that could be involved in seafood uh, processing just about two weeks ago. Uh, with Canada at full employment right now, um, they've also increased the, the number of months they can stay in Canada from six months to nine months. Now, in, in addressing the structure of the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, I think it's a really important to ask the question, how did we get here? What, where did the SAW program come from? And, and why does that question even matter? And I think it's important that we answer that because it really defines how SOP is governed and how, uh, how, what its objectives are and why the program is structured in the way that it is. It also will define how we improve the program in the future and how we address issues when they arise. So for most of Canadian history up until the Second World War, most of our immigration was agricultural immigration. That means it was mostly farmers and farm laborers that were moving to Canada. Um, the, the figure on the left shows just raw numbers of workers and the hundreds of and the, the, the thousands coming to Canada um, each year. Uh, and really, up until the Great Depression era, um, more than 50% of all, all immigration to Canada was agricultural based. There was a brief blip after the war, um, but many of these were actually just an attempt by the federal government to push urbanized. Uh, European refugees into the agricultural sector, and many of these did not, not actually end up staying in that sector. So, so why did agricultural immigration to Canada stop? Was it just a matter of urbanization and, and uh, there were no more prospective, prospective immigrant farmers? It's an interesting question. Um, one possible answer, and one that I'm, I'm actually coming around to thinking is probably the likely one, is the increasing power of subnational governments in Canada. Canada, like Australia, is a federal government system uh, where there's a division of powers and budgets between uh, the federal government at the national level and uh, subnational governments uh, called provinces. Now, between 1872 and 1931, the federal government really heavily subsidized the purchase of land, farming, capital investment on farms, travel to Canada by farmers, and the training of agriculturalists on the Canadian climate and Canadian farming techniques under, under a piece of legislation that was called the Dominion Lands Act, which famously, like the Homestead Act, gave uh, new settlers 160 acres of land for free and the right of first refusal to, to buy adjoining plots to that land. Um, but something happened in 1931, and, and I'm not talking about the Great Depression. In, in 1931, the Canadian government actually uh, turned almost all of its jurisdiction over these lands to provincial governments. Um, who, with, with far more limited budgets um, and far more limited powers uh, over immigration, quickly eliminated, eliminated the subsidies and the subsidized land purchases and capitalization of these farms. Um, this figure here is, is something I'm working on. It's, it's very preliminary. Um, but the blue line shows the decline of, of new immigrant farmers the, the, or the trending decline of new immigrant farmers to Canada following the transition of, of Dominion lands um, under the federal government to subnational governments. Now, you might be asking, what about the effects of the Great Depression and World War II? Obviously, with, with the world in a depression and with um, U-boats uh, crossing the Atlantic, there's going to be much more limited immigration. And, and while these are, I think, um, considerations and factors, uh, there's I'm actually working on a paper right now um, with new data that suggests that these might not have had lasting effects on the arrival of new farmers to Canada were it not for this transition from federally subsidized farm immigration to provincially, to, to the provincial governments. And, and the reason for this is that actually the Dominion Lands Act actually still exists today, um, specifically in those three Northern territories you see there at the top of the, the map, Yukon, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. 
Um, these territories uh, are a different type of subnational government than the provinces in the south, and they're actually still under the the uh, supervision of the federal government. Um, they have some limited powers in territorial legislatures, but actually the many lands act still exist there, and you actually can still access the same number of subsidies and the same free land in those areas. Now, of course, there's not much farming usually typically going on up there. This this picture to the right is of my uh, my father who lives in Nunavut. Um, and, and as you can see in the background iceberg there, uh, there's not particularly good arable farmland, a good fishing, but not a whole lot of other agricultural going on. But there is an exception to the, further, the territory furthest to the left there, furthest to the west, the Yukon. Um, there are arable parts of the territories, particularly in the Yukon. This is a, a, a picture of a farm up there. Um, of course, it, opportunities to farm are limited. Um, and I, I really wish I did a good plot to show you right now, but I'm still actually in the process of cleaning and exploring this data. Uh, but for a high level set of numbers, in 2016, there was actually about 30,000 acres of farmland in Yukon. Not substantive, certainly not, not, nothing compared to what's going on in the rest of Canada, but there was a, a good amount of activity up there in, in the form of growing oats, hay, and a small amount of fruits, berries, and nuts, and greenhouse activities. And by the way, that 30,000 of acres is actually an increase of about 8,000 acres over 10 years, and actually has been a, a pretty steady increase since the post-war era, where in the post-war era, there was only about 100 acres of active farmland in the Yukon, and, and it's gone up to about that 30,000. And I think this is probably the strongest evidence uh, to date that that it was really, again, that we, we, we chose in Canada to stop subsidizing the, the immigration of agriculturalists to Canada. Um, effectively closing off that pipeline of, of the creation of new farmland and the creation of, of new farmers. Um, it, it still goes on to this day in a limited form in the Yukon, which again, I think is, is the counterfactual here. Um, so what, what's the effect of this? The end of, now, we, we've effectively shut off the pipeline uh, to, of new farmers, but at the end of the war, the, uh, brought about a, a massive decline and the number of uh, farmers and owners and operators along with their un unpaid family members. This figure here, by the way, shows the domestic workforce and agriculture by class of worker. And that those really sharp declines in red and purple show the, the drop in owners operators and the drop in unpaid family members of those owners and operators. Um, as I mentioned, we, we effectively shut off the pipeline uh, to bring new agriculturalists to Canada. Um, but after the war, uh, through the Veterans Rehabilitation Program, we really um, lit the fire under the process of urbanization already happening. The Veterans Rehabilitation Act specifically facilitated the exit of farmers who didn't want to farm. It gave them generous grants to build homes in the suburbs around Canadian cities, but it also helped farmers who wanted to stay um, receive grants to purchase the farms and the and equipment for those farms of exiting farmers. So basically, the, the leavers, the ones who want to leave the farms were given a, a financialized out to move to the cities, and the remainers were, who remained on the farms were given the grants to purchase up all the remaining land. Um, as for the employed workforce, that, that blue line there, it's actually remained remarkably stable throughout this period, and it's actually even grown in proportion to, to owners and operators. Um, now, as a result, uh, you have this massive collapse in the number of farms, the farms here being the blue line. Uh, the number of farms in Canada has, has, that are independently owned has significantly dropped. Um, Number of acres under cultivation ha has declined slightly as well, but overall not not as much. Um, so what this really tells us that there's just been this massive consolidation of farms in Canada. You have, you have fewer owners and operators uh, owning much larger tracts of land in Canada. Um, as you can see here, farmers can mechanize, but the distribution of by sectors uneven, and sometimes mechanization isn't happening enough to sustain output. So really the number of acres covered by each worker is increasing. Uh, and that red dot there at the top is from the latest farm census in 2016, showing the number of acres having to be covered by workers it is increasing substantially with the, num with the um, decrease in the number of farms across Canada. Now, of course, there, there, there are, are fewer farmers having to manage bigger farms. And, and one response to this has been really to, to raise wages to try to attract workers to those farms to help them out. Uh, the orange line here is the, the rise of, of month, real, in real dollars, in real terms, monthly wages since 1946 to the last date I have is, is in 2019. Um, currently, the, the average wage rate for, for workers 
uh, in Canadian agriculture, in, in, in primary agriculture, is between $22 to $25 an hour, and that's in Canadian dollars, um, even as the domestic labor pool has shrunk. The other response, of course, uh, aside from raising wages in the hopes of attracting workers, is to mechanize. Farm mechanization has also increased, um, relatively speaking, during this time. Farms are investing in new technologies regularly, um, but the domestic response to wages has still remained rather lackluster. And this is where we, we enter the TFW program. So that, that blue line again shows the, 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 the number of, of permanent agricultural work lists moving to Canada. Um, started in the mid 1960s, we, we saw the introduction of this um, TFWs, the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program. Uh, late 80s, uh, that program, which was initially capped, had its cap removed. And ever since then, we've seen a very significant year over year increase in the number of seasonal agricultural workers coming to Canada. As mentioned, the domestic proportion of employees has remained relatively steady over this time, or has even increased in proportion to the decline of other workers, particularly, again, those, those owners and operators and, and unpaid family members. But foreign workers are, are, are very quickly catching up. Um, where, uh, as of right now, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to move my little uh, sidebar here. As of right now, uh, TFWs um, and domestic workers together comprise about roughly, uh, give or take 50% of the entire workforce when you include owners and operators, um, but certainly a, a majority um, uh, together. Now, now, one explanation for this is uh, when, we, when we go back here is that even with the rise in, in wages over this period, the, the number of domestic workers, um, again, these are domestic employees, remain relatively flat, even in response to the higher to rise in wages. Um, but this has not been the case for, for seasonal agriculture workers who have responded quite positively to the rise in wages during this time. Um, Best data that we have shows that for every 1% increase in wages over the past number of years has yielded about a 7% increase in workers over the past uh, while. And this is, again, this, um, we, we can argue that this is a, a, a genuine market response to the rise in wages because, again, agricultural, uh, seasonal agricultural workers are not capped. There, there is no limitation on the number of, of workers a farmer can hire for their outfit um, so long as they, they try to show that they've put good faith efforts into hiring domestic workers first. So SOP specifics. Um, the SOP specifically is, is um, administered jointly by two federal agencies. It's administered first by Employment and Social Development Canada. Um, they're in charge of assessing the labor market impact uh, of uh, foreign workers. Going back to this slide here, uh, even though there is no cap on seasonal agricultural workers, the um, Canadian government does have to do an assessment first about whether or not they would outcompete uh, domestic workers for what specifically was called the prevailing wage rate in a region. The prevailing wage rate is not the same as the minimum wage. Uh, so the, the domestic, the, the employer can't just offer minimum wage to these workers. They have to offer what they see as the average wage rate in that region, which is often quite higher than a minimum wage. As mentioned before, the average wage rate for, for much of Canada is about between $20 to $25 per hour for, for each worker. Now, that's one federal agency that, that administers the labor market. Um, the other agency is Immigrant, Refugees, and Citizens of Canada, which is our, our primary uh, ministry of immigration. Uh, once Employment and Social Development in Canada conducts this labor market impact assessment, they will then um, give an approval to a, an employer to hire a seasonal agricultural worker. Um, then once Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada sees that, they, then, they are then authorized to give that worker a, a work permit and a visa to come to Canada. Now, there is no formal role in, in administering the program at the provincial level, but there is a role by the uh, provincial ministries of labor who enforce health and safety laws. So oftentimes there is this informal uh, consultation that's going on between the provinces uh, and the federal government. So, so provinces will often do inspections of these facilities, they'll receive complaints um, by, uh, by wor workers who are abused or perhaps trafficked. And oftentimes those provincial ministries do have uh, I'll be an informal role, a, a strong say 
going to the federal government to say um, blacklist an employer. If, if an employer is abusing, if there's substantial evidence of, of systemic abuse on a farm and the a provincial ministry of labor finds out about it, they can actually um, then communicate that with the federal government who can then blacklist that employer going forward and, and um, impose their own fines along with the and fines uh, allowed under, by the federal government as well. Um, so those state agencies that are either in charge and administering the program or are involved, uh, SOP is an employer-specific program, meaning that uh, that a, a worker cannot just come up and legally work for, for any employer. They're only allowed to work for the employer that is written on their work permit. There is no transfer allowed between them. You can transfer farms. So for example, if a if a employer owns multiple farms, there is their workers are allowed to move in between those multiple outfits. Um, now that said, uh, I know this anecdotally and I've seen it firsthand. When there are large family outfits that that are legally separate entities, uh, it is perhaps not unsurprising that there is often an informal transfer between farms where where employer employees will move seasonal workers will often move between these various family owned farms, which again are independent outfits and will will help each other out in uh, getting the crop in. SOP is also limited to a national commodity list. If you if you go and Google that with uh, the SOP program, it'll give you a list of approved agricultural industries. Uh, and most importantly here, is, as mentioned at the top of the presentation, there is no path to permanent residency. So there is no program for these workers to, to become permanent residents in Canada with a pathway to citizenship. They receive an eight-month non-extendable permit. Now, what do I mean by non-extendable? Um, what that means is that at the end of the season, the worker has to go back to their home country, whether it be Mexico, Jamaica, or Guatemala, or, or one of the other SOP states. Um, they can come back next year, but there is no mechanism for them to stay in Canada and actually renew their permit from within the country. They have to leave and then act as a wholly new permit. Um, employers must provide and pay for transportation to Canada, so airfare. Uh, they have to provide inspected housing, meaning housing that, that meets the standard of the foreign governments that are involved. And they also provide some sort of means of day-to-day -day transportation to, to employees um, so they can go do shopping, go into town especially if there's in a rural area. Uh, these are all conditions of the, of the program. As mentioned before, wages have to be set to the prevailing wage for an area, which again is, is the average wage for that particular industry. Um, and an, or if there is a unionized outfit, a unionized farm, they have to pay the, the wage established under the collective agreement on that farm. Um, SOP has a, a, the highest retention rate out of any other temporary foreign worker uh, program in Canada. What I mean by retention is workers who try to return year after year. Um, data from Statistics Canada suggests that after 10 years, approximately 20% of workers from a year one cohort are actually still there. And this is compared to less than 1% in other industries. So in other industries, when you have a cohort of workers arrive to work in that industry, after 10 years, only about 1% of them are, are remaining in that particular, uh, without a particular employer. But for SOP, 20% um, of that year one cohort will still be there. And of course, there's a decline over the years, but it, it's not... Um, by and large, there's, there's workers continue to return year after year. So swap, swap specifics continued. Until recently, employers um, had to promote, prioritize advertising to domestic workers for a minimum of 14 day, calendar days, a three-month period before seeking a foreign worker. Um, this has been recently suspended. But what I, what I meant by this is that in the three months before a, an employer seeks out a seasonal worker, they had to advertise the job for two weeks. Um, they had to advertise and recognize newspapers, employment sites, employment centers, and other media. Then they had to show proof that the, of their recruitment efforts to say, it really show that they tried to find a domestic worker. Um, again, as mentioned, this is recently suspended. So actually, uh, with, with a tight labor market in Canada right now, the government has waived those advertising rules. The employer must then apply for that labor, labor market impact assessment and receive a positive assessment from the ESDC. Um, that labor market impact assessment is again ESDC really conducting a review of the area and see if, if the, the employer has done some good faith efforts to really dom recruit domestic workers. ESDC, ESDC still does that, um, even though the, the efforts of the employer themselves have recently been suspended. And that labor market impact assessment must be sent to the foreign government's Ministry of Labor. Um, so the Mexican government, the Guatemalan government, Jamaican government, et cetera. There is no cost, and this is perhaps some, some um, differentiation between Canada, Australia, and the US. There's no cost to the employee for conducting LMIA, so the, the um, employer can request that at no cost to them. 
um, the processing time is 14 days under SOP. And this is perhaps one attractive feature of the program is that you can you actually apply for and receive one of these assessments in two weeks after applying for it. And it's 28 days for other agricultural streams. So it's actually a, a relatively low cost or no cost program that is pretty much pretty fast response time by the federal government for getting back to the back to the employer. Similarities and differences to the US. Um, uh, some, the, some differences are that unlike the U.S., uh, most uh, SOP employees tend to live on the farm or near the farm. Uh, they wake up and walk right into the workplace. They are also mostly documented, and there are indications that it is intergenerational because most of these workers return to the home country at the end of the season. It's not uncommon to see um, a, a father, for example, bring along a son after a number of years when they grow up. Uh, Similarities, um, it is concentrated in vegetable and melon farming, fruit and tree nut and greenhouse. There is some limited agri animal agriculture. It's not much um, hog farming, for example, only 5% of all workers in that industry are represented by seasonal agricultural workers. Of course, this, this differs when you look at, at food manufacturing. And, and high mechanization tends to complement guest workers. Actually, it doesn't, there's not much indication that it's displacing guest workers, but it might displace domestic workers. Um, as, as Philip mentioned here too in Canada, we actually saw a very limited impact of COVID-19 in the field. Best estimates that we have is that only in the mid 10s, so we're talking about between 15 to 20 or so um, seasonal agriculture workers were, were passed away due to COVID-19 over the past couple of years. Where we did see a, lot, a big impact of COVID-19 was actually again in food manufacturing, so in the, in the meat packing and fruit packing plants themselves. So it's up the gold standard and we're coming up here on the end of my presentation. Um, it's often regarded as such. I've seen that tossed around quite a bit in, in literature on the subject. Um, there is a, a strong ability for ESDC, ESDC to, to blacklist employers. Um, inspections are conducted by participating consulates in the federal government. At the same time, there's very little quantitative evidence supporting the quality of the program. There actually has not been a whole lot of research done in this area that actually puts specific numbers to the quality of the program or the metrics whereby you could say that that is a good program. But there is plenty of qualitative research that suggests that while BERT workers benefit significantly from being able to send their menaces home, living conditions and unreasonable hours are particular and recurring issues. Um, last couple slides. Uh, there are recourses for workers. They can go to the provincial labor ministry, as mentioned, and that labor, provincial labor ministry can recommend the issuance of a new uh, work permit, uh, allowing them to move to a different employer or even uh, completely change industries totally if there is significant abuse. There are unions if they are available, but coverage is spotty. There is not universal collective agreements across the sector. Consulates is, a, is an interesting one because consulates oftentimes, despite uh, ostensibly being on the side of the worker being from their country, um, oftentimes are more interested in, in maintaining the employer-employee relations. In, in, their over, in their view, the consulate are going to concern saying, well, we might have one bad worker with one bad experience, but if we burn the employer, that could represent a loss of hundreds of jobs. So oftentimes actually consulates are seen among workers as actually being not so much a friend and more adversarial and wanting to maintain that employer relationship. There are federal agencies as mentioned and there are nonprofit and advocacy groups. And these, these groups often function with government funding so may actually act as a de facto government agency uh, pushing reform. And they can again recommend uh, workers to these, these provincial labor ministries. Final questions, and this is the last part of my presentation. Um, should workers have a right to PR? These are questions being explored in Canada. Um, on the one hand, uh, a right to permanent residency in Canada might harken back to our, our tradition of, agri of agricultural immigration to Canada, um, but it might also provide additional incentives for workers to put up with abuses by, by employers. If an employer ha can dangle permanent residency over the head of a worker, what might a worker be willing to put up with? in order to gain uh, a chance to a golden ticket to residency in Canada. I don't have the answer to that question, but I, I think it's, uh, there are multiple sides to that. And, and while advocates tend to favor a right to permanent residency in Canada, an opportunity to move here, I don't think we can just necessarily ignore the question of what might workers put up with if there's an opportunity for, for the equivalent of a green card in Canada. What is the role of collective agreements? Should we unionize, should be pushing for more unionized uh, work on, on the fields? Many workers actually don't necessarily favor unionization because it can um, add fees to their limited amount of, of remittances they're able to send home. Should SOP continue? Should we let mechanization reign or should we uh, seek for more food imports? I, I'll, I'll say the answer to that last one is that with there is serious conversations going on in the federal government right now to the extent of how can Canada be a breadbasket to the world with food exports, especially with the conflict in Ukraine? So my suspicion is that that SOP will continue and will continue ratcheting up 
uh, because even a brief dip in productivity to perhaps say favor mechanization, I, I don't think is in the cards right now. Um, neither is importation. I'm happy to entertain questions uh, via email, but, and uh, that's it for my presentation. Uh, but I hopefully the, the history of SOP has given you some insight. Why do we have SOP in the first place? And the answer to that is we, we stop subsidizing the immigration of permanent agriculturalists to Canada. And, and we, we provided an out to agriculturalists who are, are leaving the sector. So we, we stopped the in pipeline going in and we provided a, a very fast out to agriculturalists. And so with a decreasing agricultural workforce, we are gonna have to take seriously this consideration. Do we substitute for more capitalization and mechanization on farms or do we, do we look for workers abroad or within, or within Canada? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present. Appreciate that you are joining us from the evening. There's a lot of content to get through on these programs. So we really appreciate. Unfortunately, we've had challenges connecting to Manjula. I won't be able to have her respondent session next. So we can take a break now. Uh, for those of you who are I'll go and grab yourself a cup of tea or coffee. To keep to Ten fifty-five a.m. And for those who rejoin using the same link, to enter any questions in the Q and A.